Meanwhile in the pod cave. And welcome back to another edition of the Podmen. I'm Brad. I'm Brian. I'm Podman Ron. I'm Alex. And all four of the Podmen have joined the, uh, back together in the Pod Cave. We've been missing for a little while. Uh, again, we were just talking in the green room in the in the cave uh, that we only have a few episodes left to the uh, historic 200th episode uh, that will end the podcast. Right? Or uh, what? What? Come on. <laughs> Come on, we can do it. We've got we've got <laughs> we've got six, uh, five months. What five six months to to record two more episodes? Not going to end the podcast. No, so that's crazy oh. talk. Alex crazy. is committed to being on every one now. Uh huh. <laughs> and he barely made it today because he's getting some chicken nuggies. So uh huh. All right, we're looking for that sponsorship from McDonald's. But hey. Guys, I think that we were talking. The last movie we talked about was The Flash, uh, and there's been quite a lot of uh, movies and TV shows and conventions uh, to catch up. And I know uh, Comic Con uh, was this past weekend, right? Is that right? It's true. In the time we've been away, The Flash has literally already left the <laughs> the Flash. I think it was uh, as we were record as we were uploading last yeah. w- episode. It was leaving the theaters. But in fairness, so has Ruby Gelman Teen uh, Kraken or whatever that garbage was. The thing was in theaters for like one week. I don't know if that's in fairness. The Flash is a top four DC superhero. <laughs> what is, who is Ruby? No, I don't know. Four. Who's your four? It's uh, I mean Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. The and then, then you can say Green Lantern or Flash or Flash more than no Green Lantern. Yeah. After a nine years of the show, I'd say I would argue to say it's between Flash or Aquaman. One of those two. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, poor Aquaman. Aquaman's having a little trouble, but uh supposedly back on track for Aquaman too. Uh but uh we'll see what happens there. Maybe the Blue Beetle will overshadow Aquaman. <laughs> Maybe Blue Beetle becomes the top <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, can, you cannot deny that George Lopez effect. You can't. I mean, you can't. Charisma, I caramba, the charisma of George Lopez. All right. Uh, Brian, do we have any news or do we want to go into the reviews? We got a little bit. All right. Some, uh, some sort of quick potpourri. We got uh, just today uh, they're announced. Apparently, uh, Ryan Reynolds is going to launch his own like TV network or station streaming and he's service? a uh streaming sir is it a streaming service i have no idea everybody else has one uh it's it's something along those lines but he's already like green lighting projects so last week it was announced that he greenlit that he's they're rebooting uh what biker mice from mars which was like a ninja turtles you know rip off right. you know back in the the late 80s early 90s but just today He's got the rights, and he's rebooting or continuing Alf. He's bringing back Alf. Wow. Well, it, it, no one can stop this Ryan, Ryan Reynolds guy, right? I, no. I would, like, I, like, I would like it to be rebooted like the Brady's was to the Brady Bunch. It's a darker Alf. Like, you find out the Tanners were, you know, prisoners of the United States government for, you know, hiding them out all those years and, you know, make it just really, really dark. He got <laughs> dissected, you know. <laughs> or I Willie think or more Al. likely, Willie ends up in yeah. a, like a, a mental asylum because he's trying to convince people that he lived with. First, Alf nearly drove Willie crazy every episode. Then suddenly Alf is gone and nobody believes him that he was ever, ever there. Yeah, but but Willie is dead in real life. So, uh, uh, How is he? Yeah. No, well, poor Willie. Poor but I'm sure I'll- <laughs> hey, uh, what? Uh, PMR, since you know so much about the ALF history, you and Ryan Reynolds are connoisseurs of ALF history here. What? Uh, was there ever a, um, what am I trying to think of, of a Cousin Oliver moment in ALF where they were like, oh shit, we got to do something and bring the ratings back here? No. 
No. I mean, it stayed on top the entire time. <laughs> he finally ate the cat. He finally but, <laughs> but you didn't know it had an ending where at the, the last yeah. episode, he was surrounded by the government and he was captured. Oh wow! Yeah, it was like it was like the anti ET. Like he'd gotten a message back to Mel Mac, and they were coming to pick him up. And I don't know if it turned out that it was the government, like you know, catfishing him to catch him. Ah, was that what it was? And it wasn't Mel Mac coming to get him. No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so then, fucking so government. A, so then they did a Ralph re, Ralph reboot. Not really a reboot. Of, TV movie for Alf like five years later or ten years later. It was like in the, the mid-90s or late 90s. Well, it was when NBC would do all those Matlock movies and Father Dowling mystery movies and the Columbo and movies. Elf. They would do like a quarterly movie or whatever. Alf yeah. got like one. So it was him. He was prisoner of the government. You know, that he'd been living with the government for like ten years or something, whatever. And I don't, I don't know what exactly happened but anyway that's that's when the last time we saw Alf he was in the government's custody so all right well, I want to know what happened to the Tanners I want to know what happened to the, the yeah. people that hit them out all those years you know the young DJ starts doing crap and you know try to rescue Alf because that was his buddy or you know what, 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 happened? what happened? Well, I guess Ryan Reynolds wants to know as well. Yeah. He, we've always said PMR and Ryan Reynolds have a lot in common. Uh, I know, uh, you know, Alex, you would love to talk a little bit more about ALF, but uh, also during the time that we've been on vacation, uh, Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman uh, have released a couple of pictures of uh, the new Deadpool. Correct, yeah. Well, they yeah. Deadpool and Wolverine in costume. Pretty much comic accurate Wolverine costume. Looks pretty neat. Looks pretty yeah. cool. Pretty right. cool. Right. Right. PMR disagrees. Yeah, I, I think. He's so choppy, I can't necessarily tell. I, I can't see you nor hear anything PMR says, I don't think. There he is. Here? Yeah, apparently. No, I really don't I really don't like it. I think it looks kinda of stupid. But... <laughs> All right. I, I, I really wish everybody would quit wanting Hugh Jackman to be Wolverine all the time. Uh, well, this so hopefully is his last time. Oh, I hope. Good Lord. Where the... What? <laughs> I mean, uh, we, if anything, we all know PMR is uh, a con- not only a connoisseur of 80s uh, TV shows, but also cinematography and framing a shot and everything as we see his forehead as he's talking. <laughs> He'll he'll frame a shot, Alex. I know where you got your skills from. Yeah, he's a real he's a real master behind the camera. So, so y'all the next are, all, are you guys all excited about Wolverine and Jackman again? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Like, it's gonna be. It's not gonna be MCU. It's it's gonna be just for fun. This whole yeah. It's gonna be breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. They've shown the set is is supposed to be the rubble of 20th Century Fox. Yeah. So it's it, uh, what they're saying is it sounds like it might be a quasi version of uh you know Deadpool kill you know Punisher kills the Marvel universe and then Deadpool killed the Marvel universe. So basically, it's them giving Fo- the Fox universe its send off. And you finally get to see Ryan Reynolds and and uh, uh, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine and, and uh, Deadpool together on screen. I think it'll be great. That's wacky. That's wacky. It is wacky. All right. What other wacky news you got, Brian? We got some castings, a uh, considerable amount of castings for uh, Superman Legacy. Oh, They've I cast, forgot. We haven't talked about Yeah. Yeah. Hawk Girl. Um, which I, I don't know where she's from, but Hawk Girl, they've cast uh, Mr. Uh, Terrific, who is, uh, what's his name? He played, um, he played Dar- uh, Darwin uh, in X Men First Class. Yep. And he's also him. on, uh, uh, what's the, uh, For All Mankind. What was ah. his character on For All Mankind? What was his name? Anyway, he's like the uh, the mogul that's that's uh, 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 yeah yeah yeah. I don't know his name, but I know he's the right. private sector, you know, uh, space exploration I have company. No yeah, he's pretty good. Then we got 
my favorite, uh, Anthony Kerrigan, who is no ho Hank on Barry, is going to play Metamorpho. And really, they need no makeup. No, they could take him. As, <laughs> he's very he plain just like looking. Metamorpho. Yeah. Uh, and then Nathan Fillion is going to play uh, uh, Guy Gardner. Wow. And I let out a huge groan. Dreamcast? <laughs> what? I thought that was Dreamcasting. I, no, absolutely not. It's so bad. You, you want to hire real redheads? What's what's the problem here? Alex? No. It's, now we know why the actors are on strike. It's just one of those things where it's like I feel like I'm tired of seeing Nathan Fillion's face in everything all the time. He's like on my YouTube Shorts page, like that cop show he does, and I'm like, why? Why do I? And I think he's too old, and I don't like Guy Gardner being the first Lantern we're introduced to. I don't like any of that. Like, wow. I don't know. Who would you make the first Lantern, Hal? Of course. Yeah. Right? I think, Hal, yeah. But Hal is so boring. Well, here's the thing. Here's what I'd do. i either make it Hal or John, and I'd, I would just skip Guy. I don't care for Guy all that much. What? Uh, you can't skip Guy. I think Guy's the gonna... best. Gr- well, aside from Kyle Rayner, Guy, Guy Gardner is the best Green Lantern. Well, oh. I'm going to tell you, I think he has a big X on his head to die in Superman Legacy, and his ring's going to go to John no. That's No. Nah, he's going to pop up from time to time just to be the yeah. asshole. Yeah. No, James, James Gunn hired Nathan Fillion because he's his friend, and he knows he's going to kill him. So right. That's, he doesn't... He, a good asshole, though. He's probably a good, smarmy guy. Yeah. Hence his I, Guardians performance. I feel like here's the thing. I feel like if you're going to do Guy Gardner, I would have like. I feel like the appeal of that character is he's naive, and that's where the cockiness comes out, mm. especially in those early issues. So to cast someone older, it just feels like, oh no, you're just a. Dick. He's not, he's just he's a not dick. naive. He's just a, he's just a cocky asshole because he was a, a an athlete. He was a jock in high school. You know that's so he was why a jock all in, high school, in high, school, high school. He wouldn't play in the now, NFL. Well, you were a jock in high school, Alex. You know how they turn out. Oh, you know how they do. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, so we got some castings. We got, oh, uh, on the heels of this, James Gunn did say that Suicide Squad is not a part of the DCU. Oh, wow. So, but, we're still, but we're still getting a second season of Peacemaker. Right, right. <laughs> so Suicide Squad's its own thing because uh, it wasn't a part of the Snyderverse either. So it's just kind of right out there. I guess he did. He said that solely because you know Nathan Fillion was uh, the detachable kid uh, in gotcha. in yep. Suicide Squad. So uh, let's see what other news have we got. Uh, we got well, there's something else. Hang on, there's something else. Alex, anything from Comic Con? We mentioned Comic Con earlier. Have you heard any news from anything well, exciting? Everybody kind of dropped out. It feels like we had the Spider Man Two game story trailer. Okay. The- and did, did they resolve who Venom is? Uh, kind of. Looks like Venom's carry on, but they don't. We don't really know. But it, it's like, it looks like what you broke up. You're breaking up bad, Alex. <laughs> Venom is going to be Harry Osborn. It looks like. Oh God. Um, that's what it's. That's what it's sounding like. Uh, but it looks incredible. I mean, it's a. It, the first games are amazing. Um, <laughs> third, game, I have no doubt. It's great. Uh, I, I don't have anything else to say. Venom's in, oh my God. It. <laughs> Alex, we can't hear you. You're you're cutting in and out constantly. Every time you move the camera or uh, or your mic or shake your head, P- PMR's <laughs> drifting asleep. Brian and I are just shaking our heads at each other. <laughs> <laughs> and, we're, we're and you think now. we're going to make it to episode two hundred? I mean, come on! <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, you got to stay still looks, with that mic. It looks pretty good. Um, Venom's in it, Craven's in it, the Lizard's in it, Wraith is in it, uh, Mr. Negative's in it again. We still. Oh, and gone. We've just. All right. That's all I got. Oh, what? All we're doing is telling who's in the video game. Oh, my God. We have That's fallen so far. 
Spider-Man. All right. Sonic's Spider-Man. in it. Spider-Man. 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 Sonic's in it. Kells is in it. <laughs> Knuckles is in it. Mario's in it. Luigi's in it. <laughs> I don't know. Meanwhile, uh, PMR and Alex always see is their ceilings. I mean, this is <laughs> yeah. Can we just? Can me and you just leave? <laughs> Thanks, dude. Can I just be on your wrestling podcast, Brian? I, I mean, I'll yes. fake it. I'll fake it. I love Cody Rhodes. <laughs> Who doesn't? All right. So uh, let's. Uh, uh, any other significant news before we drift off into just naming characters? <laughs> no, well, something just interesting. The uh, Marvel you better last be good. year. I, this better I be know. good. Brian. Marvel. Marvel last year announced sixteen projects. Wow! At uh, San Diego Comic Con, sixteen. They laid like out that whole film, roadmap. TV, room. everything. Yeah. Uh, virtually every piece of it has either been completely like there's been no nothing addressed about it, no updates on it, or it's been delayed. Ah. Uh, so this year, the only thing that they uh, uh, showed was just a new trailer for Captain Marvel or <laughs> the Marvels. <laughs> And then oh they drug that poor Cosmo dog up on stage because they didn't have any other celebrities. Apparently, he's not in uh, in uh, the the uh, 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 guild. guild yeah. The Screen Actors Guild. Yeah, I... So, so they found not a, good. So they found a dog and put a fishbowl on his head. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to get the uh, Humane Societies after uh, after uh, Bob or Peter Iger now. Peter's after Bob Iger. So yeah, so this is Marvel pulling back, and uh, I think. <laughs> You know, the new guy in charge has said, yeah, we kind of spread ourselves a little too thin. We need to refocus on everything, right? Well, yeah, and it made me think, I mean, uh, how long have we been? They've been suffering. Well, suffering. <laughs> but, you know, Shang-Chi, like, when are we? Is that ever going to be another movie? No. Right. It's you, know, you can almost see the writing on the wall. I got a feeling they, they wouldn't have done the marbles if they if. You know, if they had a chance to, they would have canceled the Marvels. Yeah, uh, it's it's not looking great for for Marvel right now. Like with the, and which is goes to my whole argument that uh, they just need to bring back Tony and and Steve and all. Get it all back. Get it all back. I want to see it all again. I want to see yeah. It. I want to see now, oh my god. Now, we had a sidebar on this, Brad. Me and PMR. Well, uh, you didn't and, record and it, so that's fine. I didn't record it, good, good. but I had the epiphany. You know why he fights so hard? He fights so hard that he doesn't want him to bring back Steve Rogers. He right. doesn't want him to bring back Tony Stark. No. And why? No. Why PMR? Because it needs to go forward. We don't need to see the telling again. You got to see new characters, right? But cut, no, no, that's not why. No? <laughs> that's not why. Oh, Ronnie hates. You. He doesn't want him to start it again because he's not going to live long enough to finish it again. <laughs> no? He doesn't want him to start something new. Yeah. He needs this stuff to start winding Just keep it going. Just wind it. That, I mean, that kind of makes sense, honestly. <laughs> I mean, about it. I think the reason that Marvel, yeah. Nothing lasts forever. Look at Pixar. Pixar. <laughs> PMR is not going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. <laughs> going to last forever. Marvel's not gonna last. You know, and they're on the downslide. But but if they stop right now, he knows he saw all of everything. Tony Stark. That's uh, that's a good. That's I all think, right. I think a lot of it has to do with him that just talking shit. Or making podcasts like this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, everything is overanalyzed these days. Yes. So I think. Which we're, like, which we're about to do with Indiana Jones and Barbie and Opera. I don't know that, but, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't. I think the Marvel's movie that's coming out, I think it looks fine. I mean, I think it looks pretty good. Yeah, I Maybe that's just me. The visual effects look good. I think it looks okay. I, 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 it's kind of neat that they set up, you know, you have a main character they set up in the movie, and then you have two side characters they set up on, uh, on, on TV shows. So then they bring them together. I, I don't know. I, I, like all, I like all the continuity. Okay. But <clears throat> for everybody else, back, like they did fast, you know, it'll go away. In about five years, 
probably won't have any kind of hero movie. We'll be back to <laughs> rom coms. Yep. Stupid shit. So. Look, can I ask you to use your headphones, please? I don't have them. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> he was surprised by the recording tonight. <laughs> Did you not hear me at all? You're, you're just super choppy. Yeah, it almost sounds like you're holding the phone about a yard away from you as you're lying down in a in a pod cave somewhere or another. I don't know. I just, all right, just go on. I'm just talking. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, so that's uh, the only other thing for news is they've greenlit the Starfleet Academy TV show that's going to a uh, series. Oh, so. another Starfleet. Now, are they are they oh, draining that uh, dry? How many Star Trek series oh, yeah. are there? There's uh, Discovery's got its last season. You've got Strange New Worlds. Picard just ended, but Picard's probably going to turn into like another show with, with all those people. That's what we want. That's what all the Trekkies want. They don't want another fucking Starfleet Academy TV show. That- well, we no. just had an animated Starfleet Academy show that got canceled. So now they're going to do live action. And then you've got <laughs> the Below Decks, Lower, right? Lower, Lower Decks, decks yeah. whatever it is. Okay. So, yeah, like uh, uh, yeah, we're, enough. Paramount knows one tune to play. All right. So. Well, there is one more bit of news that came. That happened today. All right. Uh, it's pretty big. Uh, Thomas Hayden Church, who infamously played Sandman in Spider-Man 3 with Tobey Maguire. Yeah. Well, he's come out today and said he's heard that Spider-Man 4 is in early development. Right. With we, we, knew, we knew that. Thanks a lot, Tom, Thomas Hayden Church. I thought we knew. Yeah. We didn't know that. Well, I didn't know that. What's Spider Man? What's Spider Man Four? Is that with Tobey uh, Maguire? Uh, with Tobey Maguire? Yeah. Oh, that's Spider Man. Yeah, that's Spider-Man. with Sam Raimi attached to directing Tobey Maguire coming back. Is that yeah. thing? Oh man. Yeah. Well, now Brad's like hitting the <laughs> yeah <that's laughs> the mic. <laughs> this thing on. <laughs> Did you get that off Indian Wire? Yeah, that must have been straight off of Indian Wire to straight to. I, mean, I thought he was going to announce. I thought he was going to announce Sideways Two was in production. That's what Thomas Hayden Church said, "Not me, man." I, I Is he in the video the game? game? No. <laughs> I'm hoping for it. Yeah, where did where did he decide to to drop this this <laughs> nugget of truth? I don't know. It's been on Twitter on all X. Long. Thomas Hayden Church had a press conference today. <laughs> Everyone gather around. Thank gather you. Around. I have news. <laughs> Media. <laughs> Indian. I, Bob, Indian Wire, I see you're there. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> Thank you for showing up. <laughs> Thomas Hayden Church, is this about the Wings reunion? No, no, no. I wish it was the Wings reunion. <laughs> Sideways 2? No, sir. No. Bigger. <laughs> you got to think bigger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ryan Reynolds, where are you when we need you to save Wings? Hey, that's not a bad idea. There you go. Wings was a good show. Is it rewatchable? I wonder what Crystal Bernard looks like today. Smoking hot. Sure. Oh, at uh, 70. I always, the heard that she was, find that for you. I always heard she was a lesbian, but that was just what I heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was all the rage on <laughs> Indian Wire. Thomas H. Church <laughs> tell you she was a lesbian. <laughs> Indian Wire exclusive. I heard. I heard it was a rumor. Crystal Bernard turned me down. Must be lesbian. Exclusive on Indian Wire. Let's stop. Yes. I heard that her and uh, Jillian Anderson were lesbian lovers. And I heard that uh, her and uh, the chick from Mad About You was also lesbian lovers. So. Uh, so what, was, is, what have we watched recently? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean that's that's good lesbian news there. <laughs> that's we need a theme. Straight from Lesbian Wire. <laughs> <laughs> what? You heard this one? You heard this? <laughs> yeah. What eighty you know six come actress just came out as lesbian? <laughs> Crystal Bernard outed by 
podcaster. <laughs> she is going to be so pissed. Her parents have not known. Yeah, when we out her. I hope they're not listeners. <laughs> Oh my god. Next thing you know, they'll tell me about Shelly Long. <laughs> I was pressed. I don't think oh, God. She's got a husband. Nah, beard. Crystal beard nard. Apparently she grew out of it. <laughs> yeah, it was just a phase during your wing. <laughs> Thomas A. The church drove her to it. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, that's fantastic, Scoop. I mean, that is good stuff right there. The Thomas A. Uh, all of it, all of it. That was good. That's good shtick right there. All right, let's go to the movies, shall we, guys? <laughs> All right, as we talked about, uh, I think the movie-wise, uh, we've got some recent ones, but maybe not so recent if we go back in time. Yeah. Uh, to Indiana Jones and the Doll of Destiny. And, uh, you yeah, know, maybe, maybe the last time we see Indiana Jones on screen, I guess. Oh, I'm sure it is. Uh, the Which is sad because they really should have... <laughs> Uh, they should have parlayed this into like a young Indiana Jones series or something. Uh, this was, it was a comedy of errors. This movie, it was like, there was an easy path and they, 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 every time there was, the light was green, they decided to turn right or turn yeah. left. It was, uh, they could have just done it. Um, but, uh, I, and this is, this is, I think to, uh, uh, we talk about screenwriters and stuff. Nobody wants to do fan service. It's like fan service is, is frowned upon. Everybody yeah. wants to, to do something new. Everybody wants to, to spin it and subvert yeah. expectations. But all they had to do was just uh, take the pieces that were on the table, you know, put them together in an orderly fashion and let everybody take the victory lap of, you know, 30 years of Indiana Jones. Yeah. And they didn't do it. Yeah. Nope. Uh, so you were not happy with this, to say the least. No, I was not. It, it, well, for an example, for an example, they spent all of the first, very first uh, segment was the CGI segment where it was indie, uh, you know, during still uh, during the, the end of uh, World War Two. Like, so the okay. allies were the allies were winning. Uh, Hitler had already fallen. They were trying to get his. um all of his artifacts that he had collected, the occult artifacts, and get them shipped off. Um, and that's where you pick up Indy. It's Indy and Basil, who we've never seen before, wow. and uh, who's played by Toby Jones, right? Okay. And they're on this train. And, and that's, it's played that's up his for, new sidekick or something? Well, that's the father of his new sidekick. Ah. Which really, Indy was the sidekick. She was the 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 protagonist for most of the movie. But, um, so, but if they're doing CGI for all of this, if they're heavily doing CGI for all this, I don't know why they didn't just make it Marcus. Right. I would have right. preferred it just be Marcus. Right. Um, but yeah, so they, they kind of shoehorn in this new character just so they can say this character has a daughter, uh, uh, to then, kick it forward to the moon landing, you know, the, we're celebrating the moon landing. So that's the time frame. Uh, so it's in the, it's now we jump to the sixties, Indiana Jones retiring. He's a, as a professor, he's not even at, uh, at what's the university he was always at a big one. Yeah. He's not, so he's not even at the university he was at for the first three movies, which is like, why? Like, uh, um, huh. he, he's retiring, uh, she's trying to get him to help her find the MacGuffin, <clears throat> which is the Dial of Destiny. And the uh, Nazis, which I get, the guy is supposed to be Von Braun. They're not saying he's Von Braun. They're saying he's somebody else. But because he helped the U.S. get to the moon with his rocket 
technology. Ah. Uh, they're giving him all this latitude to do whatever the hell he wants. He's got his own special like secret service detail that they're, they're perfectly willing to kill civilians on you know, on his <laughs> say so with no problem. Uh, Indy's frame for murder, which they never resolve that. Like, uh, there's no resolution at whatsoever to the fact that it's on the news that, you know, he's, he's wanted in connection with these murders. Huh. Uh, and then they, they kick off on their adventure. Their adventure, in the adventure, they keep talking about that the Dial of Destiny will take them back because it's 1969, and it'll take them back to 1939. They, they say okay. this five times, right. that it'll take them back 30 years. But but because they, they want to go, they, they want to go back thirty years, or that's just what it's he set wants to. to go back. He wants to go back. He wants to kill Hitler. Okay, and that's and what take over. Proverbial. And, okay, yeah, he wants to kill Hitler and take over and do it the right way, like because yeah. he knows all the mistakes Hitler made. Makes not sense. that not that the Jews shouldn't you know be rounded up and no, put in the just, concentration camps. He just wants it's to just, do it right this time. He wants to do it right this time. Okay, so so you've got. Now, here's here's a paradox, or here's an issue with this. If he goes back in time and kills Hitler, why would they just make this guy the Fuhrer when he just killed the Fuhrer? <laughs> well, maybe, it isn't like John Wilkes Booth right. killed Lincoln and now he's the new president. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Maybe it does in like, Germany. So, so that was his plan to go back, kill Hitler, and become the new Fuhrer. It makes no goddamn sense. The, um, uh, but the bigger thing I take issue with is they keep going back to it's going to be 30 years. It's going to take you back in time 30 years, 30 years, 30 years, 30 years, 30 years. Nobody ever said why they thought it would be 30 years because lo and behold, when they actually use the dial, they go back uh, 2,000 years. (laughs) Right? So they go back to uh, um, ancient like Greece at uh, at this battle that I'd never even heard of, so they could have picked a like a battle that was more well known in history, right? right? Uh, and they keep talking about Archimedes. Well, Archimedes, they keep they keep also saying all these things about Archimedes, where it's like, well, Archimedes did this, and oh, Archimedes was a fan of that. Really? Do we know this much about somebody that you know <laughs> lived a hundred years before? Sat in a bathtub. Jesus. Yeah. Right. We- like so- Alex. Alex. Uh, yeah. Yes, we do actually. No. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. Everything it says in the movie, like in the history lesson, is stuff we do know about Archimedes. That he was obsessed with water displacement. That's yeah. what I mean. He sat in a bathtub. That's all. And said Eureka. Which this guy is a genius le- that can manipulate time, but he's just completely obsessed with the fact that wait a minute, if I put more water in this pot. It'll overflow. Well, we're talking about he was, he was alive before Christ was even born. We're, <clears> everybody we're else was very, stupid back then. We're ta- yeah, we're talking about very, very early science. Very like, early yeah. stupid but people. He, very early silence, but he figured out how to travel in time. I think it was more of an accident, like most scientists. <laughs> just happy accidents. Happy accidents. Just happy little accidents. So, uh, then we're introduced, we're introduced to made, that's how they made penicillin. Happy accident. Mm-hmm. There you go. Archimedes did it too. So, uh, but yeah, and so we're introduced to his his goddaughter uh, because Mutt's dead. Oh, right, which was kind of like you know, Boiler. little pop and so, yeah. Well, I mean, this movie's been out. It's it's already on VOD. I think uh, <laughs> we're so late to this. But um, the my whole issue with it is they could have so easily made this better, like just fixing some plot holes and just uh, put him at uh, the university he's normally at. Make it Marcus or make it Marcus's daughter or something like or, or don't even make it Marcus. Right. You've got Sala is there in the U.S. and he has grandkids. So why couldn't it have been one of Sala's kids instead of introducing this new character and stapling on a history that that didn't happen before, Hmm. right? Or just make it short round. Why the fuck they didn't make it short round? Not only did they not make it short round, there is literally no mention in the entire film at any point that short round exists has ever spoken to Indiana Jones in the past 50 years. Nothing. 
There is no nothing whatsoever re- referencing short round. Something it and Crystal Skull have in common. And well, yeah. Crusade. <laughs> right, right. But that's the thing is, if you're trying to say, look, Indiana Jones has got this. And that was the point they were trying to make was he has this extended family. So even though Mutt's dead, he has this extended family. He has these people that care about him. Right. The kid right. was his. She even has her own short round character. <laughs> right. So it's not only Indy. You got Indy, her and then her short round. Wow. So Indy gets marginalized most of this movie. And, and here's the thing, too. Indy is broken. He's broken. He's sad. Like, he's just a shell of himself. Well, I would argue if Marion has left him and Mutt is dead and he's an adventurer, he's going to double down on the adventure. You would He's going to so. be getting into shit that he shouldn't be getting into at his age. Right. That makes more sense from a story, from a story, from a narrative. Not he's getting drug into the adventure. He's the one leaping forward into the adventure and somebody else is trying to pull him back and protect him. Right. It just doesn't yeah. make sense from a character standpoint, his motivations. It's. It's bad. So, so it's Alex, so I bad. mean, you, I think, PMR, you you were not a fan of this movie, or you were okay with this send-off? No, uh, no, it was terrible. Um, no. Okay. To Brian's, to Brian's uh, uh, rant. Rant. <laughs> Analysis. Uh, yeah, they, the perfect story would have been, Short Round would have been the character, and Short Round's daughter would have been the character that went with Indy and then they would have dragged short round like he would have been the bumbling kind of Marcus character and uh, you know trying to protect his daughter the whole time and then at some point prove himself showing that he's still a badass that he was like when he was a kid there was so much they could have done and or so much, if you did so many Sorry. things done with this but what or what I was just going to say, Sal, there's a big plot point in this that Sala's grandkids, like he talks, he tells them stories about Indiana Jones adventures. Like he te- like that's a big thing. He tells all his grandkids about all these grand adventures him and Indiana Jones went on. So if you didn't want to do short round, which I don't know why you wouldn't, oh, he's man. like at the time this thing was filming, he was probably one of the hottest commodities. Yeah. Of, no. Like, no, he was filming everything everywhere all at once with us just shooting. Okay, so, so no one knew him still. In in the post production, could we have not just squeezed him into a scene? That would seem just like to that say would be he's smart. alive. Yeah, yeah, right. It could have um, been his daughter. I mean, that would. It could have been his daughter, or it could have been Sala's granddaughter. Right? right. She grew up listening to these stories about Indiana Jones, and so she wants to go on that adventure. Like so, it, it, and and. If you're looking from a diversity standpoint, now you've got a Middle Eastern lead or, you know, uh, um, supporting character to the lead that's in the adventure with him. And I like, think people would have liked that. They, it, it, If it was Sala's kid or if it would have been Short Round's kid, they would have been more accepting of this more so than they would have been the one that they'd never seen before. It just seemed like it was shoehorned in. Oh, it's the character that we've never seen before. Yeah. They wanted to be different for the sake of being different. Like, and it's this. It, <laughs> and where they have a new cast. Here's the thing: you can always just fucking recast the fucking part of Mutt. I mean, he was in one movie. Who? I mean, recast him. He's right. older. He's 15 years older. Just get hell that guy that plays the. <clears throat> Carmen on uh, the beast of well, no, the bear, the bear, that TV show, the bear, which is a that great show, actually by would the way. be pretty good. That would be pretty good. Look, as much. like kind of like yeah. Shia LaBeouf. He would have been great. You know, I mean, just recast the part. But, but the prob- the problem is for whatever. It, whether it's producers, writers, whatever, you get into two schools of thought. You get into the uh, let's let's give the audience what they want, and uh, and and this is the last time we're going to get Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. It could have been a victory lap. Uh, 
Right. Instead of that, you get and, and, and these characters they introduced, they're not going to be in another movie. This was the one time that they, like, so they could have done fan service, which is apparently in some you don't camps do that it's just anymore. like, you know, yeah. uh, it's, it's the hacky thing to do. Or you can shoehorn in characters and plot points and, and not address and, and have whole, like a Swiss cheese script. But that's, that's the artistic choice. Quick, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. Just so Alex can talk because he's the counterpoint to all of this. But yep. one more counterpoint, one more point I want to make is the the movie felt like I, I addressed the uh, the Brady's to the Brady Bunch, how the Brady's was very serious. Right. This felt, feels just like that. This is like a, like everything was just so sad and depressing and serious. And the, the fun action Spielberg type adventure wasn't there. It wasn't, there was no quips or funny quips or the, the fun, even as bad as Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was, <clears throat> there was still, and it was last still crusade. Fun. I mean, yeah, it was still, it was still fun. So this had this was not fun. I mean, it was not fun at all. They had too many car chases. It, uh, hell, I was yawning in it. I mean, if you're yawning in a an Indiana Jones movie, then you got a problem. I mean, there's there's a problem with the movie. Alex, so, I mean, I mean, I have to admit that the you know watching and. Imp- Preparation for going to see this movie in the the theaters, I started, I started watching the other ones, and that didn't help out because uh, they didn't really hold up to me as good cinema. They were fun, enjoyable movies, but nothing special. Uh, and then our back the back and forth with uh, Brian, you and Alex kind of made me not want to go see this movie either. But Alex, you're saying it's still worth a view. Yeah, it's great. All right, it's. Counterpoint, Great. Brian. Okay, here's, here's just thankful. Alex, we can't hear you. You might want to stop moving around. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. James Mangold is an excellent. Everybody loves James Mangold. Almost a perfect track record of different genres. Hey, Alex, you're gonna have to put that. You're gonna have to talk like it's a phone because you're breaking up. Okay. Can you hear me? Now we yeah. got you. Okay. Someone's fuzzy. Okay. So, James Randall's a great director. He's tackled so many different genres, and go. he's pretty much he's pretty much made great movies out of all of them. Um, I don't think he's made a single bad movie, including this one. Uh, his direction in here is great. Um, his lighting, his camera angles, everything uh, looks really, really good. Uh, the script is just a good adventure script. I I, I don't like this idea that um, we needed old characters in this movie or nostalgia bait characters in this movie when every Indiana Jones movie, besides the worst one, has completely different casts. Last Crusade has um, Sala and it has Brody, but we didn't even know Brody in Raiders of the Lost Ark. He's in like five minutes of that movie. So I would even count that as a new character and Saul is in there. But besides the point, every Indian Jones movie has a different cast and this cast is great. I don't think Helena Shaw is the protagonist. Her arc is a mirror of Indy's arc. And it's really, her arc is really just Indy's arc in Temple of Doom. It's about fortune and glory. Um, which is great. I think that's a really interesting place to put that character, considering we know how Indy started. I mean, if you release Temple of Doom, I think most people would find Indiana Jones to be not a, like a, a good protagonist, but they've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, so they, they do like it. And in that movie, he's a dick, and she's a dick in this movie, and the movie has no qualms telling you that. I think her arc is great, and I think they both benefit from each other. I think Indy is the lead of this movie. It is his movie through and through. We're talking about an 80-year-old man who can't do the things he wants to do anymore, the things that he loves, and also he's lost everything he's loved. He's lost his kid, and he's lost his wife, and he's dealing with regret and remorse, and he's struggling to find a way in this new world, a world that doesn't care about the past as much as it cares about the future. I mean, we're Ooh. talking about space travel. This so is am I, but I, I don't want to no, speak no, this no. no. <laughs> Shut up. We're so we're dealing with a man that's completely out of time. He's out of touch and he doesn't feel like he belongs anymore. 
I mean, this is a really real feeling that a lot of elderly people find yeah. themselves. PMR in. is I mean, just yeah, totally. Yeah. It's, it's a relatable feeling. I don't think James Mangold sat out to make a depressing movie as much as he sat out to make <laughs> a real movie. A movie he was a reflecting movie. your depressed, depressing life, PMR. I guess so. He's reflecting the reality of these circumstances. And I think it's actually beautiful. And I think it's a really beautiful wow. trip with this character that culminates in him realizing that he's been denying people love and he's been denying himself love wow. because he feels he doesn't. He hasn't earned it anymore, and he feels like he's too out of touch to even grasp it. And it's a really beautiful journey. We're also talking about, yes, spoilers, the ending, time travel, and it's convoluted and weird. But it's really important to Indy. We're talking about a man who's spent his entire life studying archaeology, and he gets to look his life in the face. He gets to he gets to be there and present with it. And it's sad for him because that's all he that's all he has to care about now. That's all the that's all he has. And he wants to stay, but it's that reminder. It's it's Phoebe Waller Bridge finding the glory in, in the adventure and finding the glory and finding these artifacts and it and the excitement in, in the history and that brings him back. And it's just it's just a good movie. Okay. Yes, there's too many car chases. Yes, it is thirty minutes too long. Uh. And but that's okay. You know why? Because at the end of the day, I saw an Indiana Jones movie for the last time. I watched all of them in preparation, and I had a really good time. I knew this movie was a send-off, and I knew it was going to be an emotional send-off, and I knew it wasn't going to have the same direction as a Spielberg movie, because it's not Spielberg directing. We're talking about the guy who directed Logan, the guy who directed, I think, Copland. Like, we're talking about a very, very serious director who likes serious source material and taking his characters in a different direction than where they've been before a realistic approach. And I think this is a really good approach and I think it's a really good send off. And I think it's a really important send off with a great message and a really fun time. I don't think this movie is that depressing. I think it's real. I don't think it's depressing. Um, not all real. Well, that's what you got. And that's, that's what, what you got. Indiana sucker. All about is immersing yourself. <laughs> the race of the lost Ark is so impre- impressive because it felt real in the sense of the journey felt authentic. It felt like you could actually go there and do those things. This movie feels real in a different way. It feels real in an emotional way. Uh, something that we don't usually get in Indiana Jones movie. Arcs are not something Indiana Jones really does. Um, at least they've always been subtle arcs. And this one feels very, very much the center of this movie. And I really enjoyed that. Um, I think it's a great movie. Um, I really enjoy it. It's one of my favorite of the year. Um, yeah, wow. you hear that? Spider Verse, look out! No, it's not better than Spider Verse, oh, okay. but it's good. <laughs> I'm glad you said that about the four back in time at the end because that was the really ridiculous part. Because although time travel wasn't bad, I think it should have been more subtle. He should never have met Archimedes. He should. Why? That loses all the emotional impact. No, of that moment. no he should have just. They looked down. They saw, you know ships and battle from way back whenever the fuck that was and one of those you know one of those moments in, in the Indiana Jones where it's like could that really have happened you know was that, but that's, that's but we're talking talking about just Raiders of the Lost Ark and this that do we Indy doesn't didn't see God so he doesn't know but in both Temple of Doom and in Last Crusade he's standing impossibilities right. staring impossibilities in the face this yeah, is just like, like that. I don't know. I just let him have his moment. I think it's, I think it's why. Why are we so pent up about time travel when it is really important to the character and it fulfills his emotional arc? It's not like it's just there for no reason. It's there for a very specific reason. Like if they were going to pick <clears throat> time travel, why wouldn't they pick something that's more well known than this? Why not teach people something new? Ah, because you don't get the oh shit moment when you when you see it. <clears throat> if you if you propose it correctly and you're deal and you're dealing in history that is better known, then you get that oh shit moment. I you don't get no that oh what. shit moment when he goes back to <laughs> some uh, guy well, sitting movie, in the tub. The movie sets up the battle in the first arc, and I think no matter what, seeing Romans invade a country is pretty oh shit. Because we do know about that. 
and we can we do have tech. I don't know if Joe Schmo that. knows anything about Romans and. Uh, we all took European history. Carthage. I mean, and, that's one of the first chapters you do. I know about Romans invading different countries. That's cool. Yeah, you know what they look like? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. You have more faith than uh, people remembering that stuff than I do. Right. I think it's so, I think it was a smart choice. And I really liked it, and it ties back well, to an actual real artifact. You got about sixty-five million. Uh, dollars worth of uh, viewings you need to go make up for the box office. <laughs> like, you know, it's <clears throat> when I went back. What's it, weird is people like the movie. The audience score is good. <laughs> like, they got like an eighty-eight percent audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, and like I think got like a an A cinema score or A minus cinema score. That's good. Like audiences like the movie. <laughs> It just, uh, it just but audiences didn't feel compelled to go see it or see it a second time. This is we live in an age now where you have to have a percentage of the office or a percentage of the, of the audience go back and see yeah. the movie twice. This is true. And there we're was also n- talking about one of the most packed summers of all time. Yeah. Like it ever. doesn't that doesn't matter, Alex. Like uh, if if I liked this movie, I would have seen it a second time. It if does. I liked this I movie, I might have seen it a third time. Here's no, because I love yeah, but people nowadays yeah, like me, lazy ass people. Even if you do like a movie, you'd be like, "Oh, I can, I like this movie, but not enough to spend fifty dollars on it again." Right. I'll wait three but months and watch they, it on Peacock. I mean, why do I? Right, but why what? do they look at the at the seven day drop? Yeah, it's right? ridiculous. They should measure it differently, to, without a doubt. The, but the seven day drop, they say it's not people going to see it on word of mouth a week later. The seven-day drop is driven primarily – I mean, there's some of that. But the seven-day drop and, and, and whether it can hold its place or how far it drops in, you know, on the second weekend is really driven by people going to see the movie a second time. But it had a good second weekend. It just didn't have a good third weekend because then there was Mission Impossible. And it didn't have a good this weekend because there was Barbie and Oppenheimer. It didn't have a – it had a no, it wasn't it didn't have a strong performance out the gate because critics just shat on it out the gate. Yeah. And so people were like, never mind. I'll it got a sixty nine percent by critics. That's not good. Most no, that's audiences. not good, but it's it's better than a Fast and the Furious movie. And Oof. that movie made <laughs> less money. It, but that's my point, is where it there is there is an easy way to have put this movie together and still hit the same marks that you're wanting, Alex. My argument is he doesn't, you're saying he doesn't see his fit. He doesn't think that he's valued. He doesn't think that, that he, you know, uh, that he has, uh, 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 um, relevance anymore. So if it's Indiana Jones, who's always been an adventure and known for getting in over his head, why wouldn't he, if his life didn't have meaning, why is he sitting in a recliner, like waiting to die? He would be out there gambling his life, right? He's Eighty. My, but it doesn't matter. Like, he, like that's that's the whole point. Is you say that he doesn't value, he doesn't see the value in himself. So Indiana Jones, like he's going to go out and do what the hell he wants to do. Like, and if he and if he gets killed doing it, okay. Like that makes more sense for Indiana Jones than him just sitting here, like teaching at that school, <laughs> like, like an old PMR laying on the couch in the right. nerdatory, yeah, just PMR. waiting to die. <laughs> uh, that but you, you can out, still have tell, an adventure PMR. Bring some excitement. You can tell PMR. almost the exact same story, Alex, <laughs> and tweak that motivation, and it makes more sense. Jump in the right? general lead. I disagree. Do I, don't, I don't think I'd care about <laughs> Indy. Like if Indy puts himself in harm's danger. Because he's depressed, I don't find that as interesting as they're not going to tell you he's depressed. So ah. that's the whole point. Is when did we find out Mutt was dead? I think they say it early in the movie. And then no, they, yeah, no. he says my it, died. No, it was two thirds of the way through the movie. No, no they, but they do make it. They make it the first twenty minutes. And then yeah, they, they say it in the first twenty minutes that his son is dead, and then they explain it on the boat. Yeah, if you listen to the newscast, there's a newscast that. Henry Jones recently lost his son. They don't say what happened, but they say he recently lost his son. Oh, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. But 
Either way, take out that whole nonsense uh, nonsense about him being wanted for murder. Eliminate that, like because that di- that didn't need to happen. You've already got his his call to adventure, right? His call to adventure. You don't know what his call to adventure is. You don't know why he's taking these risks. And then you get on the boat and you have this conversation. You're like, oh, now it makes sense. Mutt's dead. That's why he's that's why he's doing these dangerous things. Is because Mutt's dead. It almost underlines the point you're making better than than, than what you're defending, right? The one, I don't know. two. I I like seeing I like seeing a really depressed guy get up on his horse, just like Logan. I like how that movie starts off with a really depressed. Well, Logan. but Alex, I think you you there's a part of you like the movie, and then there's the. Well, I like James Mangold, and I'm going to defend James Mangold and be blind to any like script issues or blind to any like choices that Just didn't like make sense. A Snyder I'm fan, not, I'm not, to God. I'm not blind to any of any choices that I don't like. But what I can I say? All I can say is the movie's really well put together. Like I don't wow. see. I don't see to the level of critique that y'all do because I went in going to see an Indiana Jones movie and I got an Indiana Jones movie. It hit everything I wanted to hit and it gave me something I didn't even know I wanted was a visceral emotional reaction from me. And that's all I needed. I didn't need any. I can't wait to hear this Barbie review. If Indiana Jones gives you. All right. So, uh, Alex, you obviously, what's your rating for this? Four out of five. Four out of five. All right. PMR. Three out of five. Brian. Three. Two. Two. Wow. Very disappointing here, Alex. All right. Well, uh, when it comes to Disney Plus, I will check it out and give give my verdict. I will again I will say that I was disappointed rewatching the other movies and I honestly didn't finish watching Crystal School uh, again. I couldn't I just couldn't get past it. Um so I'm, I'm, things are not looking good for a Dial of Destiny for me, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> if I was making fun of The Last Crusade, which is arguably the best of the movies, and I was saying how horrible this was, uh, then I'm not sure if Dial of Destiny has any chance. One other little, little piece of this. Again, back to that whole let's subvert expectations. We don't want to do fan service because that's hacky, all that kind of nonsense. Probably the most famous story uh, from Indiana Jones that's not in movies is the Dark Horse miniseries, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. But we can't do Atlantis because they did it in a comic book. Ah. That's what this should have been. If he was going back in time, if you wanted to deal with this kind of stuff, instead of doing Archimedes, do fucking <laughs> Atlantis. Wow. Brian, and I think you have a problem with Archimedes. Gold. Uh, but we'll we'll talk about that in therapy later. Yep, <laughs> you really seem to have a problem with this Archimedes kid. All right, uh, let's go fast forward in time uh, to Oppenheimer ba- Barbie that uh, premiered this past weekend, and both movies are getting really good reviews. So we'll see what the drop off of Barbie is. See if people start complaining. If uh, more people keep complaining about the wokeness of Barbie, if that drops off and affects it's its too box dang office. Woke. It's too dang woke. Uh, Oppenheimer, who uh, Alex, Brian, you guys have seen both these movies. PMR. Nah, either neither one. No. Oh, okay, me either. Oppenheimer, I would I would like to see. Barbie, maybe. Yeah, I, of the two, I definitely liked Oppenheimer better. All right, um, me too. The. Let's start. You want to start with Oppenheimer? Start with Oppenheimer. Like, uh, all right. So Oppenheimer, it is much like uh, Christopher Nolan loves a complex narrative structure. Like, uh, you, sound like, like in, you sound like Alex now. Oh, yeah. Uh, insomnia, where it's dreams within dreams within dreams. You know, you, you, you know, uh, in uh, Tenet, it's like when you're watching things in reverse versus forward. You know, he likes these like... Uh, complex narrative structures. And I think uh, it was okay in this, but I do think that it diminished some of the story, what he chose to do. Mm. Uh, So basically you've got, there was a, um, not a trial, but there was an inquiry uh, into Oppenheimer, right? Uh, After uh, the, uh, um, 
Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. And so you've got him effectively on trial here. You've got uh, Strauss, who was the head of the Energy uh, Commission over Oppenheimer for a period, is looking to get uh, added to, uh, put into, uh, added to, I don't know what the president, who the president was. Eisenhower's. Eisenhower's cabinet, right? So he's looking to get, uh, he's in front of the Senate getting uh, certified to join Eisenhower's cabinet. So he's effectively on trial, right? And so you've got, but those two events are six years apart, right? So you've got Oppenheimer's trial, Strauss's trial, six year gap. But then they're both flipping backwards to uh, the time, a time period between like 1938. and 1950, right, uh, or maybe even 55, right, they're, they're jumping back to this 18-year period, and so you're seeing it, but they're not doing it sequential. So Strauss will reference something, and it'll jump back to 1938. Oppenheimer will reference something. It jumps to 1945. Strauss mentioned something. It's 1947. Oppenheimer mentioned something. It's 1941. Yeah. It's so all of these time, like you needed like the script with like all the tabs in the back to go. Like, all right. All right. Now flip back to page 17. All right. Now flip forward to page 97. Yeah. All right. Flip forward to page, you know, 203. Flip back to page seven. It was that kind of stuff happening the whole time. He it was not as confusing as it could have been. Right. If it was if they, if uh, a, a lesser director tried to tackle this. Right. But I do think it hurt the story because then later on in the movie, you start getting the two different scenes where now you're seeing the scene that you saw earlier from Oppenheimer's perspective. Now you're seeing it from Strauss's perspective and, and vice versa. So now you've got in addition to two time periods flashing back to multiple events in like an 18 year period. Now you're seeing it from two different points of view, the same scene. It was very complex in the structure that he chose. Uh, he also shoehorned in everybody hmm. that was ever probably name checked in the book, uh, modern Prometheus, which is the Oppenheimer book that this is based American, on American, American, American Prometheus. There you go. The, uh, but so it, it's like, this movie, you have to see it again, hmm. right? And honestly, you'd probably be better if you went and read the book and then watched it a second time. Uh, where because then it, I think then it would truly have like all of the punch that it should. I think some of the complexity of jumping around and that kind of stuff, you lost a little bit of the gravity of the scenes because it just hopped and hopped and hopped and hopped and hopped. Uh, whereas if it had been a more linear storyline, maybe that I think would it, there is some, it would have been better. So, so directors so. don't need to be so cutesy with this stuff. Don't try to be so creative that it may cost a little bit of the the storyline, right? Or, or if you're going to jump back, perspective or whatever. Yeah, if you're going to jump back, stick with it a little bit longer. Not just okay. Here's here's three minutes set in 1941. All right, now we're jumping back to 1960. All right, now we're going to jump back to 1930. You know, 1939, and then uh, like it would be. It was very almost choppy because, in addition to it jumping around, the sequences were relatively short sequences mm. for a lot of them. So. But uh, Alex, I enjoyed the movie. Alex, what are your thoughts on that? You're the uh, you love a good storytelling. I love the movie a lot. Um, I think I agree with what Brian's saying, um, but it didn't bug me as much. I'd go on if anyone's watched the movie JFK. Hmm. Um, I can it kind of to that um, that kind of edit, and that movie won an Oscar for best editing. Um, I think it is very in your face about it and it's it's very intentionally misleading i think but i think that's part of of the of the message is trying to tell i think the edit is very thematic in that 
there's all of these different people and all of these different situations and all of these different theories and all of this different like takes on conversations and what happened here what happened there and were, was they were they a communist or were they an American who die hard like all this convolution and all this noise and all this clutter and I think the edit complements that to an extent I think it, it it brings out that anxiety at least in me it did of like I'm trying to keep up with these names and these stories I mean it's like a game of telephone almost and I thought it really added to the dramatic weight of what I was watching okay. but I will agree that I think it deserves a rewatch for that because I feel like I missed a lot um, because the movie's trying to make me feel that anxiety so much. But to me, the weakest part here, once again, for Nolan, is the sound mix. Um, oh. He likes to play with sound a lot. He doesn't really find dialogue to be that important in some scenes. And so he drowns it out with score or with background noise. Oh. And it can sometimes distract. And I think for the human mind, it becomes like a where do I concentrate kind of thing. Yeah. But I, he doesn't, in, I think different from Tenet, he does this more intentionally where when it's more science-based conversation, he lets the noise come in because he's like, I don't think my viewers are going to understand this anyway, Stupid. so let's just kind of drown it with a beautiful score. <laughs> they don't know um, nothing about no Archimedes or anything. They're dumb. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the performances in this movie are insanely great. I mean, I could see Killian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr. winning an Oscar for this. Um, they're both fantastic. Uh, I think the last hour is some of the most dread, dreadful I've felt in a movie ever. I think it's really harrowing and really interesting and a really interesting look at how our ego dies and how we, how our vanity can sometimes is a curse and how the human condition is always looking to manipulate its next subject. Um, it's very interesting and it's really complex and that I'm just amazed that a studio signed off on a $150 million budget for a movie that is really just people in rooms talking. Whew. PMR, is this, is this your kind of movie? I mean, this, is Alex talking you out of it, PMR? Yeah, I'm kind of beginning to wonder if I want to get through <laughs> No, it, it's great. I mean, it's so interesting and it's so complex and I, I thought the I, it's honestly that's the, the problem. problem. Nolan, <laughs> Nolan made action sequences out of people talking. I mean, it's okay. really that it's really that good at directing. And the IMAX, I saw it in IMAX, and I was blown away by the visuals. Um, there's two moments where there's no music and no nothing. It's just silent, and it's just. <laughs> Is that where PMR and I can take a nap? <laughs> Let us know when those come in because we can just take it out. <laughs> I'll say the best scene in the movie is where the, when it's a, mu- a scene where the music cuts out and it's the scene where they're deciding where to drop the bomb, um, and it is awful and so it makes you sick of your stomach. It is so good. Um, yeah, I think the movie's a five out of five. I think wow. it's Nolan's best work, um, his most complex work, his best script, his best. I'd say almost his best everything. Um, yeah, I think it's really, really good. It's my favorite of his movies by far. Wow. Brian, is it a five out of five for you? <clears throat> Probably, yeah. It's, I just, there's, uh, I, I see at this point, I'm like, it's its own category. It's Nolan versus Nolan, mm. right? Okay. It's not his best, his best movie. Um, there's things that I just, I feel like there was a point that they should have made, or maybe they did have in an earlier draft and it just kind of got lost, but you had so many people that they introduced in this movie and so many of them have, um, a small responsibility and a small accountability Right. Uh, And nobody really says there's not anybody that really, really protests building the bombs. Right. And so it's almost like that whole like, you know, the path to hell is, is, you know, one small step at a time sort of thing. It's you had so many people that were culpable aside from Oppenheimer in making this happen that it's almost like, well, 
you saw one guy throwing up because like he got what what they had done but that that guy represented i guess everybody's remorse of it because you didn't really see other people show any remorse after the bomb was dropped or any sort of what have we done which uh, Oppenheimer gets the last line of the movie, um, which is very poetic. Uh, and that fixes, and, and that may be why, that may be why they're like, well, let's, let's not really, let's not make, let's not hint at this point too early, right? Or let's, let's not, re- let's let, Oppenheimer be the one that realizes this as opposed to people like trying to protest this in the interim or, 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 or raise protest. their hand and say, we shouldn't be doing this. It was, it was, everybody was like this whole, this fueled the science, the physics, the science, the physics, the science, the physics. Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we do it? I feel like somebody in that room should have been saying, should we do this? Like, how do we stop this? To there's even the point, the the scene with Truman, where Truman's pissed that Oppenheimer's trying to take credit for it, and Oppenheimer isn't. He's he feels like guilt ridden, but he's he's pissed at Oppenheimer because he thinks Oppenheimer's trying to take his 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 spot in history. Uh, like uh, he's proud of you know killing two hundred thirty thousand people. So it's, there is a little, it's, it, that gets a little wonky for me because it's like, surely, surely somebody said, wait, we're really going to, you know, we're building something that could m- murder people on a mass scale. No, and, and, honestly, and even after, so hold on a second, PMR, even after it happens, nobody's up, really like, oh fuck, what have we, what have we done? Like nobody has that moment other than the one guy puking. Outside the the meeting. Go ahead. I honestly, I was just gonna say I, I I don't know. I didn't see the movie, and obviously I didn't live in nineteen you know forty five. But honestly, I think they were just want to end this war that was killing so many people. You know, we were already losing lives. Like instantly. they wanted to put, they wanted to put an end to this war. I don't think anybody thought anything of it. I mean, it's not like it is today where we have no. over. Killing a bug on the road. I mean, no, uh, that's <laughs> not that's not how the movie because the we the movie gives you the perspective of they're building this bomb for the Germans. They're not building this bomb for anyone else but the Germans. And, so and then they miss their window to use it on Germany. And so they, so they go ahead and use it on Japan. Yeah, and so it's not the, there is a moral question here. It's like the 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 biggest question, and I think historians worldwide would have are always asking. It's like. What would happen if we didn't drop the bomb? How much longer would this war have lasted? Right. Two hundred thirty thousand innocent civilians really necessary to die, so this war would end quicker. Innocent people, did they need to die? And that's a really important question. And whether you like it, PMR, no, that's that is a moral plunger. Like we don't know whether this would have ended. We could have ended the week if after. Only you could go back in time, well, Alex. And it. It also proposes the question, if we hadn't pushed we for it, would Russia down. have the atomic bomb? Because a lot of their research was leaked. Apparently, there was a spy in La Mesa that was sending stuff back to Russia. So so us pushing forward with it, we were, we were effectively, you know, uh, helping the Russians also with their nuclear power program. So it's like we, we made this bet ourselves. Yep. So got sleep in it. It's a really important movie. I think it's super timely, especially with Russia and Ukraine going on right now. Um, yeah, there's a lot of culpability, and it's really interesting, and it, 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 it did um, that I hadn't had before. Uh, yeah. I, uh, well, you say culpability, but I, that's part of the thing that bugs me, is like, it didn't feel like any of those scientists felt any sort of I remorse they, or culpability for it. I mean, we have to look at it I don't think they were. I don't, don't think they. I don't, yeah, that's what PMR was saying. That back then, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't think. They did. No, I, if you killed two hundred thirty thousand, the snap of your fingers, you feel a sense of culpability. You're a human being. Like they felt a sense of culpability. I think Nolan 
everyone said that Nolan wrote the script in a first person perspective. So the movie is always functioning in Oppenheimer's point of view. So I think part of that culpability you're missing comes from that, that this is a movie about Oppenheimer. And when it's not, we frame it as a black and white movie. And that's also intentional that we frame it as a black and white issue. But when we're in Oppenheimer's perspective, it's much more broad. Interesting. And his lens. It's a really well. It's I would so like good. to see it. I mean, it's, it's something like four hours or something, right? I mean, it's a long one, right? It's three. Three? It's three hours. Still. It's still two and a half. Yeah, that feels so like a home 12 hour cut, though. Although I'm sure it's fantastic in IMAX. I don't doubt that one bit. I just don't know if I want to carve out time to go see it in IMAX, is all. I would. If you would. I would. I mean, I'm sure it's I good. Think. But, you know, I also thought Tenet was going to be good, and I never finished watching that because it was a little bit too – trying to be too cutesy with the back and forth and all that kind of stuff. And I so, normally like that kind of stuff, but with Tenet, I'm like, eh, you know what? I'm out. Oppenheimer's – the pacing is really, really good. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. It, no doubt that it's a great movie. Uh, well, you know, there's, that's, And there's also – there's also like an Amadeus moment. So. Oh, okay. In some – theatrical releases right because i if it's what i think you're talking about uh i just saw today that they're uh they're editing a few things they're editing some clothes onto florence pew yeah oh, are they no 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 uh, i was gonna say there's an amadeus <laughs> moment um yeah they've got to put some clothes on florence pew if he ever wants this to be seen in like a high school you know uh, civics class or yeah. or, or history yeah. class no there's there's like a uh amadeus moment when you realize that well, you, the movie Amadeus, when it's like well, you realize who the bad guy is. Yeah. Uh, it's been a while um, since I've seen I, Amadeus. People are complaining about the nudity. I don't. I think the nudity serves the story perfectly, and it's done really tastefully. I don't think it's done at like the ex, like just to have sex for sex sake. And honestly, it doesn't make you. It's not like it doesn't make you horny or like. It doesn't, it's not that feeling. <laughs> it, 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 it's more of a device. I would. It's not like short Alex. If you would like to take the twins to see the movie again, you might have a different feeling on those scenes. Yeah, but I, <laughs> because Florence Pugh, a naked Florence Pugh, will make anybody horny. I don't care if you're dropping a bomb on three hundred thousand people or not. Those scenes aren't meant to be like titillating. Exciting. I think they're just both meant to be like very, they're meant to show intimacy. Uh, like a close to characters. They edit this. What? Do I need to hurry up? The yeah, you're going to have to hurry up to the theater. But again, I think she'll show she show, she shows her stuff in other movies, so I think you're okay. Yeah. PMR. All right. Well, that it sounds like a fantastic movie, no doubt. Uh, it sounds a little too heavy. Why don't we head over to the lighter side of a, to- a movie about a toy? I mean, that's got to be a fun lighter. family fair, right? And you think <laughs> what of the two movies, one of them I let my wife left bawling. Wow, it was not Oppenheimer. No, Barbie hit home with uh, with the misses there, Brian. Yeah, I did. I did also cry in Barbie. I would like. Oh to God, God, Alex! Hey, oh my surprised. God! <laughs> PMR, what went wrong? Hit, there's two moments. <laughs> there's two moments that hit me, and uh, good. yeah. So I said, uh, I told PMR when he, uh, after I saw it, my quote was, if you thought the, uh, the Lego movie needed a little more existential crisis and gender politics, this is the movie for you. Right. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> if you're one of the many that thought, man, this Lego movie was good, but I need a, few, a little bit more gender politics and... And it was that yeah, close that made me not go see it. So. Oh, man. <laughs> but you were the only one. You and I were the only one, PMR. Everybody else in the world went to see it. So I, it did something right. I mean, I thought this was going to be more like Legally Blonde type uh, movie or something like that rather than uh, having an actual statement here. No offense yeah. to Legally Blonde. <laughs> yeah, no, there is there is absolutely a statement wow. uh, in this movie. Like a... Uh, yeah, the statement was dumb. Blondes can get a law degree. There you go. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a good enough state. Uh, so, statement. Alex, can you summarize the the real plot of the movie here? Aside from 
you know, Barbie you know, finds herself. I don't know. Besides the cinematography and the music, can you comment on the actual story? Okay, well, get this out of the way real quick. Production design and cinematography are both great. Direction is beautiful. Great, blah, 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 blah. It's gorgeous. Uh, Lots of pink. I don't want to design the Oscars. The movie itself is about Barbie uh, living her normal Barbie life um, in, Barbie. in Barbie land. Um, and when but suddenly some weird things start happening to her, uh, she isn't standing in high heels. She can't stand like with her toes on the ground anymore. She's not walking her toes. She goes flat footed. She starts thinking about death. Uh, it's a um, light on her legs, um, which is pretty funny. And then so it leads her to a journey to the real world uh, okay. with Ken. So she's uh, a toy. She's n- kind like of like Toy Story type thing that yes. goes to the real yes. world. Okay. Yes, she's a boy who's being played by somebody, but it's not. It's played more like she's real. Okay. Like she, but it's like she's being played with somebody, but she can still go to the real world. Like oh she can God. venture. To Oppenheimer movie. sounds more clear than this movie. <laughs> yeah, this one. This one, you kind of just have to go with what it what okay. it tells you right. are the rules, and you just are like, all right, and it's right. it's fine, it's fun. Um, and then from there we kind of get, like Brian said, it's a it's a very gender politics heavy thing. Uh, Ken, Ken, who's kind of been sidelined as just the accessory to Barbie in the real world, discovers the patriarchy, and so he goes back to Barbie Land and institutes the patriarchy in Barbie Land because um, there it's more of a matriarchy. It's a it's like reversed, right. and so Ugh. so basically Ken becomes like a feminist, but for men, a men's rights activist okay. kind of. Um, and so it's kind of they play how all the men are are the the fear that women ha- that men have of women like taking over the world uh, with feminism. They kind of play on that with the okay. Kens. Um, it's a really what I'll say here is it's a good movie that's not made for men, but it's a, a movie that men should go see because I think enough. the things it speaks on um, the feminine view that a lot of men get confused by. I think it makes those points really clear. Um, and I think it's an important movie for men to go see, especially if like you have like a little girl or you have a girlfriend or, but if you have boys, then to, fuck it. You don't really need to see it probably. Right. You're Is trying to, I'm here. No, you I, think, you have sons. I think it, I think it shows you a different lens on the feminine view. Um, but it's not, but necessarily, not necessarily. I don't care for it all that much. I liked it a lot. I'd probably give it a four out of five. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's perfect like most women do. I'd still find flaws with it, but I'm glad they ha- there's a movie like this for them to go see. Um, so look at them, yeah. those people. I'm glad those people get their own movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brian, uh, what do you think about this for those people? Uh, those people. I mean, I enjoyed it. It's, uh, but uh, the. Some of the uh, points they were trying to make, basic. Well, I mean, when you, if you if you taking it like when you're in the theater, you know, you probably you're just on the on for the ride. Yeah. Um, just because your wife you zoom out a little bit. The movie is that what you're saying? Your What's wife that? drug you because your wife drug yeah, you to true. see this movie. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, when when you're if you look at it from like uh, like that you know, mile high view, essentially the men, uh, look at when, look at Barbie as an object, right. That they want to win even before any of this happens. Uh, once Ken introduces them or once Ken sees the, the our world and the right. patriarchy and he brings it back. So their, their behavior is already kind of toxic. When they see the real world, they double and triple down on the toxicity, right? And they start ga- – this is, the, I guess, the piece that, that gets me is they start gaslighting the Barbies. Ah. And so the Barbies are just totally subservient to, to the Kins, and they didn't really explain why. Uh, but it was just basically like they uh, – so uh, there was – no, there was there was nobody that said again, kind of like the whole uh, Oppenheimer complaint. It's like there's nobody going. Wait, this isn't right. 
Mm. It's like Barbie's gone. Ken goes back. Barbie comes back, and the the women are effectively, you know, subservient to all the Kins, and the Kins are are all broed out. And it's like, uh, I don't know if they needed to show how that happened or, or how they kind of made that work, uh, or I don't know. It was just weird. It was just a little wonky. Like, yeah. uh, but it it was. Well, it doesn't matter how this happened guys suck like it was it was as soon as guys saw that they could get a one uh they could they could manipulate the situation 100 percent of them did that's but that is probably true on the flip mm, side that probably is reality i mean we, oh, we man, saw that maybe. in she-hulk too yeah there was there was some <laughs> she-hulk uh, concerns in this so i think the movie yeah i agree with brian that's how he took it at first i do think it's that part because more of a common commentary on what men think women are going to do like they're going to gaslight us into into thinking that they can do better and all that so be kind of that talking point um but yeah i do agree there's a ton of dissidence in the movie where barbie's arc i don't want to spoil anything but barbie's arc is completely different than where we leave barbie land so what happens in barbie land is very different like how we end there is very different to how we end with the character of Barbie, like Mark Robbie's Barbie that we're following the entire time. Yeah. And it doesn't sit right with me. There's a, it's a tonal dissidence and a thematic dissidence that I just, I don't really jive with all that much. And I think it could have been done better. The script kind of loses me a little bit. It's not subtle at all. I mean, there's no subtlety yeah. here on what it's saying. And I think it hurts the movie and this lack of, of of unified conclusion also just doesn't really jive with me. Here here's something else. They already had a character in there that could have been pointing these things out, right? Cuz you've got Alan in the in the movie which is uh Michael Cera and you know, he was basically Ken's accessory, yeah. right? So, you know, Ken was Barbie's accessory just like a new pair of boots. This is this is Bar- Barbie's boyfriend. Alan was Ken's accessory. Uh, and so he could have been going, this isn't right. What are you guys doing? He could have been kind of like arguing with, you could have seen some of that. Where, yeah. But his motivation isn't even that. His motivation is, get me the hell out of Barbie land. I want to leave. It, it's not, hey, let this is wrong. I have been a victim of this. Now you're making the Barbies a victim of this. Like he could have pointed out some of this stuff. Uh, without getting too heavy, but just you know, just a couple lines, like just to kind of uh, where somebody's going. Wait a minute, this like you got to stop. What you're doing is not right. Something like that uh, to the Kins. That doesn't happen. And when Barbie comes back, or, or like he doesn't care if uh, you know he was a, a victim of all this stuff. Now he's seeing the Kins make the Barbies victims of all this stuff, and he doesn't care. He just wants to get out of Barbie Land. So it's like you even had that character in there that could have like pieced a little bit of this together and made a better connection and they still didn't use him in that light. Huh. Yeah. So. Yeah. But it's still a fun movie. A fun little thing. Yeah, it's a, jaunty, movie. a jaunty little romp. Yeah, it's still good. I think it's a good movie. I think it actually is. It's um, the second most uh, important movie of the, the year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the, for me, the high, uh, Ryan Gosling's skin is amazing there's a song in there that is just freaking awesome i mean it's it's great that that he'll he may win an oscar if robert wow. Downey jr does win that best supporting actor i think ryan gosling's are gonna get nominated but that could be a win for him as well wow um, strong uh, part of the well because tamara and i were talking about it and what what yeah. kind of got her emotional about the whole thing and it was kind of interesting point we have all this nostalgia stuff all the time. Uh, the, the reason why we got so, uh, I'm so pissed about Indiana Jones is because right. it's it's screwing up the nostalgia I have for the property, right? Uh, but but men get uh, things that are nostalgic, right? Yeah. And by, for a lot of a lot of times, women don't, especially not on this scale. So for her, what got her upset was she was like, you know, it did take her back to playing with the dolls. It oh. did. It, it did kind of like it not only reminded her of when she was 
you know, a little girl, but also like the struggle she has as like, you know, a working mom today, you know, uh, and all the hats she has to wear. So, uh, but then it also, there was this level of it that it made, she told me, she was like, it made me miss my mom. Like, wow. because, uh, there's a part, you know, part of this is a mother and a daughter and then them not connecting. That's what makes her start, you know, thinking about the death and, and all those type of things. So it, there's, uh, it had, it was almost like toy story three yeah. for mm-hmm. her. Yeah. Right. So, um, where we're thinking about, you know, growing up and, you know, putting away the toys or give, you know, don't give the toys to that girl, like that kind of thing. That was like the, the nostalgia piece for us. Uh, she didn't get that, right? Like, because, but she got this. So we'll it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that was, that was the way she kind of summed it up, why it, it hit a nerve with her and, and she loved it. But that's why she got emotional, was all those sort of, those gotcha. sort of things that, they kind of snuck up on her. Yeah. So there's a scene with an old woman, some old woman, random old woman. We lost you. And, um, there you go. Carla from yeah. cheers. There's a scene with a random old woman, uh, about 45 minutes in. Oh and yeah. Yeah. That got her too. That made me cry. I, it hit me in a Dang. place I wasn't expecting. And, uh, especially if you know who that woman is, I don't like, I'll let you do your woman. Research. Well, do you want me to tell you who she is? Uh, the yeah. creator of Barbie? No, she's... It's her daughter. It's her daughter. It's the yeah. creator of Barbie, who is the inspiration of Barbie. Uh, who Barbie was meant for was her daughter. Well, she named her Barbie because that's her daughter's name. Wow. Yeah, her name's Bar- so Barbara. So it's, it's a really, really beautiful moment. It really, um, yeah, and the ending really hit me, too. Uh, Bar- like, it's just... <laughs> It's it's a really well made movie. I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's really important, and I think it's a really impressive <laughs> second most important I, movie of the year. It's the highest opening weekend for a female director ever, and ever. I think, um, yeah, it's all. It was awesome watch, walking into a theater and seeing everybody in pink. That was really fun. Um, my theater was packed. My theater had a like. It was just. It was a great weekend. It was an amazing weekend at the. At the it was just so much. All right. Well, at PMR, did they convince you to want to go see Barbie or, or Oppenheimer? I'm not sure if they did a very good job here. No, uh, I'm, I'm pretty good, sure I'm not going to see either one of them. I'll, I'll probably watch them. <laughs> okay. I love it. I'll go take you. Don't worry. I'll see him next week. I'll go take them take to see Barbie. Uh, so what's, uh, what else we got? That's it? That's, That's it. it. Are you ready to wrap? Well, I had a... Uh, potpourri. Uh, I got I got one thing I'm watching on TV. So, no. PMR, we haven't well, heard uh, much from you. Let's let. What are you watching? Yeah, yeah. You do your PMR. you do your thing. You do your little thing. I was gonna say, uh, uh, Alex recommended the show, uh, and I talked about it earlier the bear. The bear, I love the bear. Oh yeah, and uh, fantastic show. I mean, wow, what a great show. Yeah. Um. Two seasons, just finished it. Uh, I wasn't crazy about the first half of the second season, but it really like got really good towards the second half of the second season. Um, but yeah, and it's a very stressful show, but mm. but uh, I, I loved it. I love it. Love it a lot. I highly recommend and looking right. forward to the whenever that comes out. Yeah, we've talked about it before. Like the bear, and I finished season two. We finished season two this week, uh, but I had stopped. I think I'd stopped with episode three because I'm like, this is uh, it's it is some of the most stressful TV <laughs> watching I've ever done, right? <laughs> and that fucking Christmas episode. Oh man, God! Boy. I told you, I, season two, episode six, man. Holy shit! That. Like, I don't, I can't believe there's not people getting triggered by that. Like, I just triggered by it. No, I mean, like, because I've had panic attacks before. Like, uh, there are, it bubbles. It bubbles with, like, I gotta, I gotta stop. I gotta stop watching this. Or you can't binge it because you're like, oh, fuck, I, I got PTSD <laughs> from that episode. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. It is so unbelievably stressful. But then it's you know then later on it's it pays off and it's rewarding. Well, the, and, the, and you thought it was going to pay off and be rewarding in the season two finale no. until well, well, that yeah. one thing happens, and it's like God damn! Like, can we not just <laughs> have just a moment of peace? Mm, well, no. like, I mean, it was kind of nice because I, I said that like. Alex said it was episode six was that Christmas episode, which is bonkers. I, I don't think I've ever been so stressed out. I mean, people yelling on top of people, on top of people. I mean, it's insane what was going on in that episode. And maybe one of the best of TV ever made. And, and it was an hour-long episode at that, so it made it even more like intense. Because most of the episodes are like 30, 35-minute episodes. Yeah. Well, the two episodes directly after that, Oh. They were kind of like palate cleansers. I mean, they were both very chill, relaxed, very feel good episodes, and uh, brought everything back down. And I was like, okay, this is really, really good. And uh, and then, like Brian said, the the last the season finale episode started out really okay. This is gonna this is gonna be good, but but the two drops and like the last <laughs> fifteen minutes of it, oh. yeah. Damn. So, Oh. It, it is a good show. I, I would highly recommend it. But I mean, it is a very stressful show. And that first season, the first several episodes of that first season, sir, you you have no idea what the fuck is going on, really. I mean, yeah, season one, uh, really, season one, all the way through that that Christmas episode, they're almost all just stressful. Every episode has that that like uh, anxiety you know, uh, a level to it. You've got those two palate cleanser episodes. And then you thought, ah, oh, it's all coming to fruition. Like it's, you know, it's all worth right. it until that last like 15 minutes of the, of the season two finale. And it's, but yeah, it's, it is not, it's like the anti Ben show. Like you can't, like, I can't watch most of the time. I can't watch a second episode. Like I have to just like walk Jeez. away. So yeah, it's stressful. Did right. you oh, go ahead. I was going to ask Brad if he's watched it. Yeah, I watched a few episodes. I, I enjoyed it, but as with most things, uh, you know, I can enjoy knowing that it's a good show without having to watch it. Uh, I will say, season two, Brad, I think you should go and finish it. Like, I really do think you should. Because uh, the way season two, like, they keep talking about the last, like, 15 minutes or so of season two, but what's so genius on, of it is that it builds to that subtly throughout the entire season like at brad and uh, brian and ron get what i'm saying but like the show builds to that level for that character and yeah. it's very background but it's very intentional and it's just it's the best writing i've seen ever i mean without even you having here you half the time can't even understand what they're saying because they're talking over one another but it's that's what makes it so good and so compelling. I mean, it is just so amazing. I mean, ah, yeah. So great. So great. So great. So great. Well, and there's another thing that heading into that Christmas episode, I don't know that they had ever, well, they're all in Chicago, yeah. right? Even the mom, but they've never really like referenced the mom as being alive, right? They've never said like, and she's never shown up before that Christmas episode. So there's also like this dread going on in that episode about, Oh yeah. Is she going to kill herself? Right. Yeah. At Christmas. And it was, they, they were not pulling back from that at all. Like it was like, if, if they walked back in the kitchen and she was hanging from the ceiling fan, it would have been like, all right, that checks out. Yeah, like the, that's how stressful that episode was. So it's so great, so so great. Uh, I gotta uh, go, guys, but it's been a pleasure. Uh, well, it was uh, the pleasure is all ours. I'm well, glad that you yeah. told us about the two most important movies ever made. That hopefully and, you'll yeah, get to, you'll best, take PMR to see one day. Absolutely, best movie ever. Um, all right, yeah. All right, I'll all see right. you guys in a bit. All right, all right. later. All right. 
Well, I had a little tidbit. Have a tidbit. Go at a tidbit. Hopefully end on. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, me and PMR went on an excursion. What? A uh, road trip? Uh, yeah. The week, uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before. Where, Where did, did we, we go? go? But what was our big, the highlight? What was the highlight? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I recognize that from uh, the reboot of Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> no, the original. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, we uh, we went to Cooter's, uh, Cooter's Nashville. Garage. Wow. Cooter's Garage, Nashville. Yeah, Cooter from uh, Dukes of Hazard fame. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Has a museum in Nashville with all sorts of Dukes of Hazard memorabilia. Brad, they had and merchandise for sale. No, oh. they had the Duke Hazard game, Brad. Oh my God, I remember featuring that in a video for high school one day, one time, many years ago. <laughs> they had uh, the wrist racers, which I had as a kid. Well, wow. I have one now. I mean, yeah. uh, who am I kidding? Yeah. So uh, they had the uh, uh, the Mego action figures. They had uh, they had they had the Daisy Duke underoos. <laughs> the Tamara right. had. With, which the panties were little. They had like a, a now we're talking about your wife's panties making, making they, her they cry. Had Daisy, Duke, yeah. they had Daisy Duke's panties. There. Oh, nice. Cool. Her pants. Her cutoffs. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, just, her, you, just her panties. But they were recent. There. They were recent. They were used. <laughs> the, yeah, the past f- five years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara. They were grannies. Yeah. Oh, they were grannies, no doubt. They were, for, but they were panties. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tons of like. Uh, I mean, it had a lot of. Uh, it had uh, the General Lee. Okay. Right. It had uh, uh, Dixie Daisy's Jeep. Yeah. It had uh, the patrol car. Right. It had. Um, uh, they had Cooter's uh, tow truck. Cooter's tow truck. You can get pictures in all of them. They didn't. Uh, Boss Hogs car? No. They they didn't have the... No, they didn't. They didn't have uh, Boss Hogs. uh, Okay. With the steer. Yep. um, No Boss Hogs. But yeah, it was fantastic. It's a free museum. Yeah. Just now, uh, if you want a photo in one of the vehicles, it's ten bucks, <laughs> or you can do thirty for all of it. Yeah, why not? Splurge. Uh, we and they had a, a good gift shop and stuff. Me and PMR got a photo inside the General Lee. Was this uh, w- this was a right like right across from Grand Ole Opry, right? Yeah, it's very close right. yeah. from that that shopping center, like the mall or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, we it's, uh, Discovery. Or it's uh what is it? It's not Discovery Sorry. Mills. It's yeah, Opry it's Mills. Opry Mills. Opry Mills. Where the new Grand Ole Opry is, the new location. We because yeah. we mm-hmm. went to when we went to Nashville a few months ago or whatever, and we went to a tour of the the new Opry House or whatever. And I saw that there, and I'm like, oh my gosh! Like, I was vetoed. It was three to one, so we didn't. They wouldn't go. take. No, no one had any oh. interest. <laughs> but Brad, was, we got the car. We got the car. Got a picture of the car. Yeah. And like. They wouldn't let me sit on the passenger side of the car where I would look at least cool. They throw me in the back seat. <laughs> like you're a fucking prisoner. <laughs> oh, look at the kid back there. <laughs> I'm in the front seat. He's in the back. Yeah. Have you seen the photo that I posted? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I thought it was Coy and Vance, definitely. Yeah. So the guy, I'm like, okay, this is going to be a cool picture because. In my head, yeah. you know, don't be in the drop. You didn't. Thing. You didn't tell tell Brian to switch places with you and just f- give the extra I ten bucks. For the, I, I paid for the photo. Oh, so well, I was you, that is, never mind. Forget so, it. You every so, right, Brian. Every right. So I thought Brian would be in the driver's seat. Yep. Then either either I'd be in the passenger seat and yeah. then they'd take a of us looking up like a head on, or they'd even let me like hang out the window and you know put my right. hang up. Pop the roof. Sit know? on top, kind of, yeah, sort of, yeah. Yeah, you know, sit in the window. If everybody did that, pop. yeah. Yeah, if I did that. No, the fucker puts me in the back seat. <laughs> yeah. like, I look like a five-year-old. <laughs> hey, uh, the little one's going like to have to go in the back seat. Daddy, go fast. Go fast, daddy. <laughs> the little one's going to have to go in the back seat there, buddy. You're going to have to tell him. <laughs> The there was a booster seat back there. At least he didn't make PMR use it. 
back there. You're going to have to sit on that, kneel on that booster seat and lean outward so we can see you, son. And you know what? The door opened, too. Which oh, that's disappointing. disappointing. I would yeah, have liked to see Brian, Brian and I didn't get to slide the over the hood. I would have liked to see Brian yeah. crawl through the window of uh, of the General Lee. That would have been good. Like, oh, <laughs> oh my God! Well, that's fantastic, guys. I mean, I would love it if you guys did a field trip, like uh, to to you know some sort of uh, nostalgic place, uh, you know, every couple of months or something. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Uh, here's the thing, Brad. We were in Nashville for four days. Yeah. We went to Broadway, right? We went to the Johnny Cash Museum. We went, uh, or we went to the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, the we went, we went, at, we went to all these places. Do you know what head and shoulders was the highlight of that trip? <laughs> uh, I Cooter's Garage. Cooter's, Cooter's garage. garage. I was going to say the uh, uh, Bachelorette uh, during the evening time, but uh, yeah. Cooter's Garage, it too. Completely, the wrong Cooter. No, he, no he, he, PMR took me to, broad, uh, to Broadway at 2 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> you mean 2 a.m., right? No, oh. 2 p.m. Oh, okay. Because the 2 a.m. is a little bit more hopping, I think. I think yeah, yeah a, I think it's a little more hopping. Exactly. <laughs> it took it at 2 p.m. <laughs> 2 p.m. Man, it's jumping. Broadway's jumping. <laughs> yeah. Before rush hour. Oh. <laughs> We we gotta get him before rush hour. <laughs> we gotta get outside the perimeter before all. Well, if, yeah, if, so you know, my my uh, Nashville experience wasn't much better because uh, I think the highlight for us was Odin wanting to go see the final resting place of uh, President James Polk. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> oh my god! That was the highlight for us was to see. <laughs> Wow. You missed. I'm telling you, if you'd gone to Cooter's Museum, yeah, the Cooter's was, Garage, was right there. It was like it took that trip from like a an eight to an eleven. Wow. It was good, good beyond good. a shadow of a doubt the highlight of that trip. Did they yeah, have flash was there? Stuff. Was he stuffed? There was a stuffed flash. It had a stuffed flash, but it wasn't the stuffed flash. Wow. <laughs> Oh, well. Just a stuff flash. Just a, well, stuff. One of the stunt flashes. And Brian was, was friends with the guy that was there. He was like really friendly and talking Brian. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. And he, well, you could notice, or you noticed like uh, with the memorabilia and stuff, you had lots of stuff signed by Catherine Bach, right? You had lots of stuff signed by Tom Wopat, and obviously everything signed by Cooter. Um <laughs> But Georgia uh, congressman or something, wasn't he? At one point? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and oh, so, but you, you know, you could tell like John Schneider did not have many no. things signed, if mm. anything signed. Wow. And so, um, uh, was it me that asked or you that asked? It's like, who's the nicest? Oh, I asked. Yeah. Who was yeah. That? He, he asked and the guy's like, well, you know, uh, Tom Wopat's real, real nice. He comes in all the time and he's actually coming back. Like, I think he's coming back like next week or the week oh. after next, like the, uh, the first week of August. Wow. Uh, he goes, he's here all the time. He's super nice. And, 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 uh, but I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't want to go out and say, well, obviously him saying that it's like somebody isn't nice. Right. Well, I'm like, let me guess. It's John Schneider. And he goes, well, you know, <laughs> like so. John Schneider apparently is not, uh, is well, not the, up to the effect of, well, you, you can, you kind of notice there's not much things. He's, he hasn't signed anything in there. Except gotcha. the hood of, so we're wow. Like, oh. That's a good it, it was wild though, Brad, if you walk through and I've got the, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you the pic. I'll post the pictures. Uh, Cause I did panoramic pictures of like some of the cases, right? The amount of, of merchandise Ooh. that was out in yeah. the 80s with the Dukes of Hazard on it is unbelievable. Like it, it would be equivalent to Spider Man today. That's yeah. how big this thing was. <laughs> wow, the it most was important TV it show on, in, of the decade. Lunch boxes, t shirts, sleeping bags. Uh, like uh, it was on. Everything. And I would imagine the work, all that stuff in that place was probably in upwards of two or three hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Even with the autographs. 
<laughs> that's not true. They brought it the, down. Uh, <laughs> that's not true. You know what? You I'll, I'll buy I got everything the in here for two hundred. <laughs> I'll give you a seven grand for the whole thing. Just leave the keys on the counter. <laughs> oh, Ben Cooter, the, uh, or whatever his name is. I, I can speak to uh, personally. I've got the Bo and Luke uh, um, Mego figures, the little three and three quarter Mego figures. Of course. I've got the uh, generally, you know, the the the, the, the roof opened yeah. um, to put them in, and I've got that wrist racer. <laughs> and he said, because they had a case of those wrist racers, and I'm like, uh, I was like, too bad those things aren't for sale, because I'd want one on the blister, you know? And he's like, those things go for about $300 each now. Like, oh, uh, you're rolling up like uh, Boss Hog now. You're like, I was rolling up like Boss I, Hog. So, yeah, I, the, the merchandise in there was it was or the the exhibits that was some some pricey stuff there yeah. was some pricey stuff in okay. there but it it's wild to to you don't remember how many of these things existed till you you see and it's like i've 80 percent of the stuff that that was there i didn't remember existed and yeah. i'm like holy shit there's the train set i forgot the fucking train set <laughs> or oh, the, next time the, let's um, uh, try to get some audio from it next time we will definitely mm-hmm. <laughs> We could have interviewed him. Could have, I mean, or just, you know, talk amongst yourself. Oh, my gosh, look, here is the blah, 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 blah. That's well, true. What I asked him when the uh, hazard days were going to come back, and uh, it's like a hazard fest. Right, right. He, he didn't know they hadn't had one since 2019 because oh, of COVID. fucking COVID. If, you know, maybe do a hazard fest because hazard fest has all of them guys – Plus BJ and the Bear. Yeah, well, maybe the podcast will bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> what about the seven lovely five, ladies? Five of the seven lady truckers. They're still <laughs> not in the old folks' home. Not so lovely, but uh, they said that the General Lee that we rode in or that we took the picture in, well, they actually did the jump at uh, oh, Hazard wow. Days in 2012, I think. Yeah, they had a picture of it. Yeah, I mean, PMR did, was it, you know one uh, consolation maybe that uh, knowing that John Schneider was nailing some intern in the back seat of that car one day. So maybe that back seat was just fine for you. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Catherine Bach could have been back there. You never know. You never know. You never know. All right. Well, that's fantastic. We should have uh, led off with that. Well, we, we next time, Brad, we'll, uh, we'll record. Yes, please do. We I know our listeners uh, <laughs> would love to hear about your wacky adventures. Dukes of Hazard Museum. If you go to the ALF Museum next, then that would be something to, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> I think that that wraps it up pretty well. Movie wise, I don't know what we have to look forward to, uh, but maybe maybe something. We'll have to find some sort of theme. What? Blue Beetle. Uh, August eighteenth. Yeah. Again, I don't know if we have something if that's to look forward to, but yeah, that that is a movie coming out. Yeah, we've got uh, next is uh, Turtles. Oh, is yeah. pretty soon pass. Uh, ha- oh no! Ha- next is Haunted Mansion. Pass. Uh, then Ninja Turtles. Then um, oof. yeah, exactly. Meg. Pass. The Meg. Then Blue Beetle. Then uh, mm. Mm. then it's a. Uh, there we go it's to a bit. A dry spell. We're going to a dry spell. All right, PMR, you're going to have to think oh, of no, a, a theme uh, the or something. The Marvels. When is the Marvels coming out? Ugh. That's in November, I believe. Okay. Yeah. All the right, time there we'll you probably go. record again. Oh, uh, you know, we didn't talk about uh, Secret of Nation. Yeah. Is it we'll over still, with? Uh, uh, no, no, not yet. We'll, we got one left. We'll we'll one okay. left. We can do a wrap up. How about that for next episode? We'll do a wrap up. Yeah. We got to shit off the that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got to... Very good. Uh, 
Yeah. All right. Well, Brian, why don't you go ahead and sign us out with that, that lovely uh, nostalgic sound of the General Lee. Until next time.